Um, my name is Adam Blackwell. I'm the Vice President of International Development Services Group. And on behalf of the team at the Global Terrorism Trends and Analysis Center, which ETAC, I'll be moderating this session. This is a continuation of a series of talks by eminent people in the field of terrorism. The views expressed here are those of the presenter. Professor Kumar Ramakrishna is a professor of national security studies, the provost chair in national security uh, studies, the dean of the S. Rajarantnam School of International Studies, RSIS, as well as a research advisor to the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research at RSIS. Prior to current appointments, he was the head of International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research, the head of the Center of Excellence for National Security, and the head of National Security Studies Program. He was also Associate Dean for Policy Studies. A historian by background, um, uh, Professor has been a frequent speaker on counterterrorism before local and international uh, audiences, a regular media commentator on counterterrorism, an established author in numerous uh, internationally uh, referenced journals, the author of many books, and in the respected uh, journal Perspectives on Terrorism, which identified Professor Ramakrishna as one of the Southeast Asia's leading terrorism experts. His re recent research has focused on understanding, preventing, and countering violent extremists in Southeast Asia. The professor will speak for approximately 20 minutes on ex extremist Islam, recognition and response in Southeast Asia. We'll then have about 20 minutes for dialogue. Please use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. And Professor, over to you. Thanks, uh, Ambassador Blackwell. And uh, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, in the U.S., it's uh, evening here in Singapore. Uh, as uh, Ambassador Blackwell has uh, pointed out, uh, <clears throat> I uh, well, I'll be speaking on this particular topic, uh, online extremism and identifying uh, what I call Salafabis in Southeast Asia. So, uh, as Ambassador Blackwell uh, mentioned briefly, uh, recent uh, last year I came out with a book uh, on extremist Islam recognition and response in Southeast Asia. Uh, so my talk essentially draws upon uh, this particular work. So uh, as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, uh, just uh, to sketch, sketch the evolving threat picture, uh, <clears throat> the transnational terrorist threat situation in Southeast Asia has evolved in the past 20 years or so since the September 11 attacks and uh, the discovery of the Al-Qaeda-linked Jamaat Islamiyah or JI cells in, Southeast, in the Southeast Asian region uh, the threat back then, 20 years ago, was uh, essentially from organized terrorist networks like Al-Qaeda and JI uh, that were, the, were at the outset uh, relatively hierarchically organized, certainly in Southeast Asia in terms of JI. But since the, well, over the past decade or so, the threat has evolved. There are still organized network type threats like uh, ISIS and Jamaa Anshur Daula or JAD in Indonesia. MIT, which is the East Indonesian Mujahideen, the Abu Sayyaf group in the Philippines. Uh, and thanks to internet and social media, the extremist ideology has evolved and spread through cyberspace. So you have uh, certainly seen, just like other parts of the world, the rise of lone wolf attacks and certainly self-radicalization cases. In fact, last year, there was a major uh, uh, report by the Singapore Ministry of Home Affairs which pointed to the uh, pro-ISIS ecosystem on social media as a concern. So my talk uh, today will examine the evolving online transnational Islamist terror threat in Southeast Asia at this point in time, but also other elements of the Islamist extremists or what I prefer to call the Salafabis ecosystem in the region. <clears throat> so uh, very quickly, a broad uh, kind of like a overview of the current violent extremism landscape in our region. Uh, I have to say that uh, I think there's been a, a sense of a decreasing threat, uh, kinetically speaking, due to co the continuation of uh, effective counterterrorism operations in key countries. Certainly, we have seen leadership decapitations and retaking of a terrorist safe haven. Certainly, in Southern Philippines, uh, there's been a lot of progress there. Uh, but we still have seen uh, a few plots and attacks reported in, uh, in the region, right? Uh, of course, the pandemic uh, restrictions, uh, 
uh, affected not just the general population, but also reduce the opportunity for the militants themselves to carry out their operations. Uh, it also reduced crowds in public spaces for, you know, which provided targets for attack. But the militants, of course, didn't stand still. They, they talked about increasing lone wolf uh, attacks. There were a few such attacks. But what we have seen as well is a group, uh, group growing involvement of women, youth and family networks in operational roles, not just support roles, but operational roles such as suicide bombers uh, well, uh, in the region. Uh, and of course, uh, like many other parts of the world, uh, during the uh, lockdowns, the uh, restrictions on movement due to the lockdowns because of the pandemic, um, people uh, spend more time online and this raised the likelihood of vulnerable individuals being radicalized, right? So I, I mentioned at the outset that uh, to me, the, the threat uh, of uh, Islamist extremist ideology, uh, we need to unpack this a bit. What do we really mean by it? As uh, we all know, there have been different terms that have been used, radical Islam, radical Islam, Islamism, Wahhabism, uh, etc. Uh, even Salafism. But uh, Salafi, right, is too, the term Salafi is too broad. And I would say in Southeast Asia, it's actually a very sensitive term. Uh, and anyway, what, which Salafis are you talking about? Are you talking about the modernist Salafis, the purist Salafis? So my argument is that we should, uh, analytically speaking, drill it down a bit more. So the real challenge, in my view, is what I would call Salafabis extremism. I didn't invent the term Salafism. Uh, Salafabism. It's been uh, invented by other scholars like Khalid Abu El Fadil from the U.S., uh, uh, the late Professor Riaz Hassan, and Philip Haltman, a German scholar. So, in a nutshell, Salafabis extremism is essentially Wahhabis purist Salafism, right? Uh, and this is a quotation by uh, Khalid Al Abu Al Fadil. What Salaf what Salafabism is? So, it is a supremacist Puritanism that compensates for feelings of defeatism disempowerment, alienation, right? I mean, as you can see, uh, it's a very, uh, essentially believers versus non-believers, right? Uh, there's, it's a very rigid way of thinking or uh, theology, which is very rigid. According to this model, there are only two paths in life, path of God and the path of the evil one, right? And according to this interpretation, the Salafabis interpretation, Islam is the only straight path in life and must be pursued at all costs, right? Regardless of how, it impacts uh, other people's rights and well-being. Now, Salafabis extremism essentially is manifested uh, uh, in two modes. What I would call the, the which is very familiar to us, the violent hard Salafabis Salafi jihadist mode, and these are essentially the violent guys, right? Uh, you know, ISIS or Al Qaeda in Southeast Asia, Jamaat Islami or JAD, but also the more uh, subtle, harder to detect. Uh, what I would call the not violent soft Salafabis Islamist mode. So yeah, just keep this in mind. Two modes of uh, Salafabis extremism: the violent hard Salafabis Salafi jihadis, right, and the not violent soft Salafabis Islamists, right. So why not violent? Why do I say not violent instead of non-violent? Uh, there's been a lot of literature, actually, a, uh, academic literature, talking about uh, these uh, uh, these ideas. For example, the uh, scholar Alex Schmidt has argued that some ideas carry within them the seeds of at best intolerance and at best violence. So so-called non-violent extremists have actually been found to be ideologically closer to jihadist organizations than the moderate Muslim uh, majority. So that's why I personally, I don't think there's such a thing as a non-violent extremist, although the term is widely used. Uh, I would call I would I would use I would use the term not violent extremists. Another scholar, uh, Jacob Olidot, uh, shares a similar idea. He he says because of a shared theological DNA, it's not that hard to move from a quietist to jihadist because essentially uh, it's the same ideology, right? It's the same ideology. Thomas Heckhammer similarly says that there are sociological and discursive links between militant Islamists and so-called non-violent actors sharing the same dominant rationale. So what's the point? Soft Salafabis Islamists have a shared theological DNA with the hard Salafabis Salafi jihadis we all tend to focus on. Both groups, the soft Salafabis Islamists as well as the violent hard Salafabis uh, Salafi jihadis, they are both 
the same in the sense that they are Salafabis extremists. Just it's just that operating in different modes. One in the soft mode, uh, not violent mode, and the other in the hard violent mode. So to me, soft Salafabis Islamists who are harder to detect, especially online, they are more accurately understood as not violent rather than genuinely non-violent. So that, and I, in my my view is that the soft Salafabis Islamists are arguably of policy concern too. We also need to distinguish, as I argue in my book, the, we have to distinguish between the Salafabis radicals and the Salafabis extremists. A radical is not an extremist. Uh, a radical is relatively open-minded. You can debate, negotiate uh, with him. You can perhaps come to a, some common understanding. It is the extremist who is close-minded and impervious to alternative viewpoints. So to me, hard law enforcement measures, measures should be used to deal with the extremists, both the soft Salafabis Islamis, as I mentioned, and the hard Salafabis Salafi Jihadis, because as mentioned, these two groups, categories, share a common theological DNA, right? But the, the radicals, are different because these are the guys we governments and civil society could potentially work with because these guys they may be salafabis in their orientation their thinking but they are they are those they are able to work within genuinely willing to work within secular multicultural political systems peacefully and constitutionally so the policy challenge is to differentiate the extremists from the radicals and indeed the moderate Muslims, right, within the Islamist political parties and civil society spaces in Southeast Asia. So the question then becomes, how do we identify religious extremists in general that can help differentiate them from the religious radicals, right? So I talk about seven key characteristics of uh, well, religious extremists, which also applies to Salafabis extremists, right? The first characteristic of religious extremists is identity supremacy. They believe that that particular religious belief system should be on top, uh, above universally recognized international customs as well as mainstream national constitutional ideological and theological currents. So identity uh, supremacy. Number two, the second characteristic, in-group bias. My group has a good essence, right? And therefore, my group, my in-group, is morally superior to the out-group. Third, uh, my uh, in-group is not only morally superior and has a good essence, the out-group has a natural bad essence. So there's uh, identity supremacy, there's uh, in-group bias, and uh, three, out-group prejudice. The fourth characteristic, right? This obsession with purity, right? The extremist does not want his in-group's good essence to be contaminated, contaminated, so to speak, through too close uh, commingling with members of the out-group. So this is expressed uh, in the, on the ground through, for example, an emphasis on social segregationism, uh, social distancing, discrimination in various ways, uh, certainly no intermarriage, no patronizing of the you know, out-group members' businesses, for example. Uh, a fifth characteristic, Low integrative complexity, which essentially means a very black and white view of the world, very simplified black and white view of the world. Six, a tendency to engage in dangerous speech towards outgroup members. So uh, I've talked about, I mean, I've written about how dangerous speech can be expressed in two modes. In the hard mode, this is a direct incitement to outgroup violence. For example, the guy may say, go out and kill members of the outgroup. But sometimes online, you don't see that so uh, direct, right? You see uh, more indirect incitement, right? Through linguistic dehumanization, through innuendo, which, which uh, tends to promote rather than outright violence, uh, intolerance, right? So that's what I call the soft mode of dangerous speech. And the seventh and final characteristic of religious extremists, right? Which also applies to the Salafavis extremists is the quest through any means possible, including potentially violence, the political power to restructure the wider polity in society in line with a the Salafabis or whatever religious vision, right? And which tends to marginalize relevant outgroups, right? So these seven key characteristics 
of religious extremists in general, and Salafabis extremists in particular, uh, highlight two further key points of note. Religious extremism in general, including Salafabis extremism, is what I would call an uh, acute form of religious fundamentalism. That's number one. Number two, the, and it's important, violence right, is, not just, uh, the, is not just expressed in terms of physical harm. It can also be built into the sociopolitical structure. It can be structural, right? So uh, some scholars say that, you know, well, you shouldn't really take the extremism bit that uh, seriously because the religious extremism is a mere rhetorical device to mask uh, what are essentially socioeconomic grievances. But to me, uh, I, the I think the relig religiosity is real and substantive. So religious extremism is an acute form of fundamentalism. And there's been a big literature on the fundamental, uh, fundamentalism phenomenon. I won't go into details. Uh, but essentially, fundamentalism uh, uh, is a sense of embattled rel religiosity. Fundamentalism is uh, religion under threat. So I understand religious extremism, including Salafabi's extremism, as a fundamentalist belief system that legitimizes structural violence against relevant outgroups. And in the Southeast Asian context, Salafabi's extremism is a fundamentalist belief system that legitimizes structural violence, not just physical violence, but structural violence against non-Muslims and also those Muslims who are seen as apostates. And uh, structural violence, just to quickly uh, uh, re, uh, illustrate, it's, it's more than just hostile physical action. It, it includes uh, verbal attacks, uh, discrimination. Uh, Johan Galtung many years ago talked about violence that works on the body as well as violence that works on the soul, right? So Galtung's point was violence can be built into the structure, right? So the point is, extremism does not always need to manifest in physical harm. It can be more structural and indirect. So this whole idea of structural violence and physical harm implicit in it is well captured in actually the US Anti-Defamation League's pyramid of hate, right? So this, uh, this might be familiar to a number of you. So uh, the first three, uh, well, the, the, the first three levels from the bottom, bias attitudes, acts of bias and discrimination, you can consider that to be not violent extremism, right? Whereas when you go to the, the last two, bias-motivated violence and genocide, that, uh, that is the violent extremism. So the point is, uh, there is, a uh, from a social, social psychological perspective, uh, there is a potential for progression from not violent structural violence to violent physical violence, right? And in fact, uh, there have been many scholars that talk about this. This uh, uh, scholar from uh, Germany, the German-Egyptian scholar, Ham uh, political scientist, Hamid Abdul Samad, has talked about this before. For example, okay, about the, the perils of uh, linguistic dehumanization, he says that to utter a word like kafir is to embark on the first step towards violence, right? Treating those with different beliefs or ideas like, like animals and paving the roads to acts of terrorism and murder. And I think this is an important point. Preachers may not openly endorse violence, but their social views and treatment of others legitimize strengthening the spiritual framework behind Islamist terrorism. So his point actually makes a very strong point. No one who lets Salafabi's extremists uh, preach anti-democratic, anti-human servants of hate in public should be surprised when sooner or later their messages lead to violence, right? We certainly see this sort of thing in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, I mean, this is a well-known uh, extremist <clears throat> uh, leader in Southeast Asia, uh, Bashir, Abu Bakr Bashir. He was leader of the, uh, spiritual leader of the Jama Islamia network in Southeast Asia. Just to give you an example, I mean, this is uh, in essence a dangerous speech in the soft mode. And this is when he, uh, Bashir was speaking in public, right? So just taking a look at this, you can sort of uh, see that it's not a very friendly public sermon, right? Uh, but the you can say it's intolerant, but here there is no direct incitement to violence, right? But this is a uh, Bashir in public, right? Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, a, journal, a journalist uh, once asked him, why, why are your sermons so unfriendly? And his comment was, you know, I'm only a craftsman selling knives. 
I'm not responsible for how those knives are used. Which to me, when I read that many years ago, I thought it was a uh, well, interesting point, uh, comment to make. But Bashir in private, right, and this is uh, 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 reported by an Australian journalist who managed to uh, uh, get, uh, get to be part of a, a relatively close meeting. In private, Bashir was more open about, uh, you know, what he would like his followers to do to non-Muslims, or this particular case, tourists in Bali, right? Uh, he called upon young Javanese youth to beat them up. So that's, well, that's direct incitement to violence, right? Uh, he called Muslims Indonesia, reject the laws of the nation's parliament, right? Uh, and so it's the same, it's, it's essentially, this is what I mean, the Salafist extremists can toggle, he can toggle between not violent and violent speech, depending on his assessment of the evolving context. He's a Salafist extremist, Salafist extremist is, a, is an extremist, right? Right. So uh, there's another example, uh, very quickly. Uh, this, this gentleman uh, was actually barred from entering Singapore last year. Uh, he is an Indonesian preacher, very charismatic, uh, big social media presence. His messages are uh, seen to be witty, right? Uh, I mean, he's got away with the word, with with words, right? And it also is to be to be fair. There has never been any evidence that he actually supports, uh, for example, groups like Islamic State. So you can't really technically call him a Salafist extremist per se. But uh, if you look at his postings, you can see dangerous speech in both the soft mode and the hard mode. For example, he has referred to non-Muslims as kafirs, right? Uh, and said all those other things about the non-Muslims, right? As you can see, uh, it's claimed that suicide bombings are legitimate, right? Uh, and you know, the thing is, uh, although uh, Abdul Samad Batubara himself may not have the directly said very violent things, uh, he may have promoted intolerant rhetoric online, but his followers are the people who actually went a step further and, you know, called for Singapore to be bombed and destroyed. Uh, one of his uh, followers posted uh, stuff like, you know, we need to send Islamic defender troops to attack Singapore, like 911 in New York. Uh, another another follower said that uh, just one missile, Singapore will be finished. Uh, and, in, and the thing is, uh, Abdul Samad, uh, his online sermons also helped radicalize a young Singaporean who believed that if he fought for ISIS as a suicide bomber, he would die as a martyr. So Abdul Samad, Technically, may not really be a Salafist extreme, a Salafabis extremist, right? Because he's not, uh, can't see that any evidence that he supports Islamic State, but he certainly indirectly nurtured Salafabis extremism, right? And the thing is, he has also claimed that Singapore is uh, Malay land, right? Uh, and this goes to the point about structural violence, right? So the implicit and his his. Uh, sermons tend to give the impression that, you know, well, non-Muslim Singaporeans, you're in a Malay archipelago, a Muslim archipelago, right? So, you know, you should, uh, uh, well, you should know your place, so to speak. And, I mean, and this is extreme in the sense that it, it represents a clear deviation from the internationally recognized legal constitutional status of multiracial, multi-religious Singapore as a sovereign, independent, secular country, right? So the wider point is there are Salafabis extremists online in Southeast Asia for sure. But there are other types of fundamentalist extremists associated with Southeast Asian Islam like uh, Abdul Somad, who are extremists, right? Uh, and they're active on the online space too, right? So uh, at least in Southeast Asia, we are learning not to over-focus on just uh, those ex uh, Salafabis extremists who are linked directly to Al-Qaeda or ISD. There are other types of fundamentalist extremists as well, right? So coming to the end, right? So how does the Salafabis ideology that sustains and regenerates these uh, threat groups in Southeast Asia get disseminated? Uh, what, what I talk about the three Ps, persons, places, and platforms, right? So I call this uh, the persons, places, and platforms represent the ideological ecosystem, right? that actually goes beyond social media, right? So in Southeast Asia, the Salafabis ecosystem, of, uh, which comprises, as I said, the three Ps, refer to persons. These persons are the guys who directly influence and help radicalize uh, individuals. Uh, 
person, first P. Second P is platform. And platform can be publications by well-known extremists, uh, print publications, audio, visual media, carrying extremist content that radicalizing individuals can immerse themselves in. It can This can include social media, doesn't have to be social media, right? But there are various platforms. And places, these are uh, extremist spaces, right? Where individuals can gather with, with uh, extremists uh, and get radicalized, whether they are private homes, extremist religious institutions, training camps, private uh, uh, sports clubs, whatever. So the, this is the ecosystem. I summarize it as three Ps, persons, platforms, and places. And I'll give you an example uh, in the, the book, uh, which I wrote last year, I talked about <clears throat> a few guys. Uh, one, of, one was this uh, gentleman, uh, Abu Hamdi, not his real name, right? So how uh, what how do you apply the three Ps or the persons, places, and platforms uh, framework to him? How was he radicalized through that uh, Salafabis uh, ecosystem? The person that essentially had a big influence on Abu Hamdi, Abu, Abu Hamdi as a 19-year-old was uh, Muhammad Jamal Khalifa, who was Al-Qaeda leader, Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law, actually, and who was chief of the International Islamic Relief Organization, who had set up and funded uh, it was a charity, Islam, uh, uh, charity which was linked to uh, Al Qaeda. In the late 1980s, uh, Khalifa set up the this uh, Darul Imam Shafi boarding school in Marabi City, in Southern Philippines, in 1989. And Khalifa was a significant figure, person that uh, helped radicalize Abu Hamdi. Darul Imam Shafi as a boarding school was a significant place in Abu Hamdi's radicalization as well. In fact, many Darul Imam Shafi graduates later joined Abu Sayyaf group and later even the uh, Moral Islamic Revolution Front in the earlier stage before MILF began to become uh, relatively more moderate, right? So not notable Darul Imam Shafi alumni included the Abu Sayyaf group leaders like uh, Gaddafi Jajalani and uh, Yasser Egasan. And in terms of platforms, Abu Hamdi, uh, I mean, I interviewed him many years ago. He was telling me that within Darul Imam Shafi, publications by uh, people like Iban, uh, Iban Tamiya, right, who's a well-known uh, classical uh, Islamic scholar who tends to be, uh, well, his more uh, extreme views tend to be uh, influential in uh, jihadi circles, right, was always uh, uh, circulated within the Darul Imam Shafi. And other core Salafavis ideologues such as uh, Maududi, Said Qutub, Al Wahab himself. Another person I uh, actually got to know was the Malaysian uh, Jama Islamia treasurer, Wan Min Wan Mat, who's now reformed and working with the Malaysian government. The person that influenced Wan Min Wan Mat uh, very significantly was Bashir himself and the co founder of Jama Islamia, Abdullah Sunkar. So, Wan Min Wan Mat who was a lecturer in a Malaysian university, technical university in the south, south, south part, southern part of the country, got to know them. A uh, very significant place where one Min Wan Wat was uh, radicalized was uh, this was Santran or religious boarding school called Manu Hakim. There are also private homes that are places where uh, one Min Wan Wat used to attend, uh, University Technology Malaysia, uh, UTM in Johor. Uh, not the university as a whole, but certain spaces in the university, right? And platforms, publications by Abdullah Azam, Iman Tamiya again, Wahab Kutub, the, the usual people that tend to figure on jihadist uh, reading lists, right? Uh, so again, persons, places, platforms. Uh, so this, these are, uh, this comprise the ideological ecosystem in which people like Wan Min Wan Wat and uh, Abu Hamdi uh, were immersed in and got radicalized. So finally, <clears throat> how can we counter Salafavi's extremism in Southeast Asia? I talk about the so-called 4M way, right? Uh, how we can respond, right? So the first M, right, is message content, right? So I talk about uh, the need for proactive alternative narratives, uh, much, uh, much better than reactive counter narratives. For example, what I mean is, uh, if the uh, uh, Salafavis extremists say that the, the government is against you, 
a counter narrative would uh, be no, the government is not against you, and I'll give you an example rather than you know like reacting all the time. Should uh provide an alternative narrative. For example, actually to tolerant Southeast Asian Islam is uh fully compatible with modernity, or Southeast Asian Islamic cultures are just as authentic as uh, Islamic culture in the Middle East, right? So it's more proactive rather than reactive message content. Apart from message uh, content, the second M is message framing. How do you put the message across? And this is where some uh, uh, communications scholars talk about the message being sticky, right? Uh, it's got to be uh, memorable, right? Uh, snackable content, the use of satire and humor. The third M, message dissemination. How, how you, you, you have your message content, right? You got your alternative narrative. You have your uh, uh, humorous uh, message, but how do you disseminate the message? And this is where precision, I argue, pre precision in the use of platforms for particular audiences would be actually worth thinking about, right? So in Southeast Asia, when I did the research, uh, it, it was uh, this, this, this uh, discussed that, you know, Twitter may be good for government and media, but Instagram for youth, right? Uh, that kind of thing, message dissemination, uh, and finally, the, the, the fourth M, I would say probably the most important, you may have an excellent message, right? Your content may be great. You may uh, have a good skill in framing your message. It can be very sticky, right? You, have, you may be uh, spot on in terms of your platform for disseminating the message. But if the audience is not in the mood to listen to you, you got a problem, right? And this is where ultimately, good governance to address the wider political, social, economic grievances are important because uh, good governance, which addresses very effectively the underlying grievances uh, that give, uh, give rise to uh, discontent, uh, would impact the receptivity of the target audience to your positive messaging. So right now, for example, Southern Philippines, uh, although uh, very positive steps have been taken towards uh, 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 Bangsamoro, uh, self determination with the uh, creation of the uh, Bang uh, Bangsamoro uh, autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, which is a very powerful thing, right? The slow pace of Marabi reconstruction, relatively speaking, most analysts would say isn't that good a thing because you, you do need to bring uh, uh, the displaced persons back to uh, Marabi city, uh, otherwise, the, the uh, and you know, sort out the the job situation, because otherwise there will be uh, discontent which can fuel recruitment to extremist groups. Yeah. So ultimately, yeah. So that's what I wanted to like bring across to all of you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Black. Uh, thank you very much, um, Professor Ramakrishna. Um, we do have some questions, and I did promise to let you. Uh, Go. I realize it's late there. The first question is, uh, can you talk about local resistance to these groups? And what is the landscape and effectiveness of, lo of local militias in hotspots where these groups are most active? Um, okay, so in, in uh, like places like, uh, it, it's a varied picture in, in Let's uh, take uh, Indonesia, for example. Uh, civil society, I would say, is playing a very big role now uh, because right now, uh, the Indonesian government, the, especially through the uh, BNPT, which is the National Counterterrorism Agency, has uh, engaged in a very big way with uh, civil society to sort of uh, address uh, the underlying uh conditions that give rise to uh, uh, this Salafabis extremism. So that kind of resistance in the non-kinetic sense is actually very important. Of course, if you look at Indonesia, the work of the police in particular, the uh, Densus 88, uh, uh, the Detachment 88, Police Counterterrorism Force, uh, that is still very important. But ultimately, uh, you need both kinds of resistance, right? You need the, the kinetic resistance, which is represented by Densus 88, and the non-kinetic resistance, which is very important, which is uh, all the other things I mentioned as well. 
in the South Philippines, as I mentioned, the Bangsamoro uh, autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, Baram, uh, that has been a very powerful step in terms of creating a uh, autonomous uh, governance structure, which is really been taken to by uh, very well by most of the uh, the Moro uh, southern Philippine Muslim population, and this has helped to reduce the uh, support for the likes of, uh, for example, the Abu Sayyaf group, Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters. And in fact, if you look at the situation past couple of years, uh, past two, two or three years, certainly since the Marawi battle in October, May to October 2017, uh, past two years, three years, there have been a, a spike in the number of surrenders by the uh, Salafabis uh, militants belonging to groups like Abu Sayyaf group, uh, Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters. And this is, uh, so that's, uh, again, it's it's uh, a combination of uh, resistance uh, kinetically, right, Armed Forces Philippines operations, but also the non-kinetic side as well, governance, good governance, right? A similar thing in Singapore, Malaysia, uh, it's not that kinetic, actually. Uh, a lot of the, the work is essentially on the counter- uh, narrative or alternative narrative space, uh, particularly in Singapore and Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The next question um, is, what kind of community support or lack thereof exists for extremist Salafavists in the cultural context? What kind of, uh, sorry, what? Was, uh, kind of community support or lack of support exists for extremist Salafavists in the uh, cultural context? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, if you look, for example, at Indonesia, uh, a general point that can be observed is that uh, the, the regions in, for example, Central Java, West Java, East Java, where the historical Darul Islam separatist movement used to operate, and also in uh, uh, South Sulawesi, right? Uh, these uh, regions where there's been a historical separatist movement tend to be also where you find pockets of uh, community support for some of the Salafis, Salafabis, uh, extremist groups. A good example. Uh, in recent times would be uh, in Poso, which is a city in uh, uh, Sulawesi, right? Uh, Poso has been a kind of uh, 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 community site. I wouldn't say base, but uh, an area where historically uh, there has been uh, extremist uh, Salafabis uh, support uh, and in recent years, the MIT, the East Indonesian Mujahideen, they have always uh, operated in very small numbers, but uh, they have always been resilient. They have been active in that part of Indonesia, uh, and partly because of pockets of support in Poso in Sulawesi, right? Uh, in fact, it's only very recently that a uh, joint uh, Indonesian military and police operations have essentially defeated MIT, the East Indonesian uh, Mujahideen, Indonesia, Indonesia team of MIT, East Indonesian Mujahideen in Poso and Central Sulawesi. And that's because, partly because, uh, Poso has historically been, you know, uh, a culture which has had a history of uh, separatism and uh, extremism uh, among pockets within that place. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would say that the situation, uh, even in Poso, is definitely uh, improving because, as I mentioned uh, recently, the MIT group has all has been all but uh, decimated. Very, very. There were very few uh, militants left there anyway. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Indonesia. Let's. Uh, there's a question here about: Can you talk about the 2018 anti-terrorism? bill or law in Indonesia and its effect on countering terrorist groups? The 2018 uh, anti-terrorism uh, legislation essentially came about as a response to 
uh, the uh, rather shocking uh, incidents of uh, what some people have called a uh, well family terrorism, where, for example, uh, well, essentially in uh, Surabaya, Eastern Indonesia, in May 2018, there were entire families, radicalized families that were uh, involved in attacks on uh, churches as well as a police station. And this essentially involved entire families and this essentially uh, created a lot of concern, understandably created a lot of consternation amongst uh, Indonesian counterterrorism authorities and this helped to uh, uh, bring about the uh, political will to sort of like a uh, enhance the capacity of the uh, law enforcement to sort of uh, uh, deal more uh, strongly with uh, some of these uh, groups uh, in terms of uh, the the number of uh, the days uh, you can, uh, for example, detain some of these guys for questioning and that kind of thing, uh, as well as uh, definition of who is a supporter, you know, what you can do to supporters and that kind of thing. So essentially it empowered the Indonesian authorities to take stronger action uh, to sort of deal with uh, the, the spread of uh, this. Uh, well, these guys uh, who were involved in the uh, incidents in May 2018 in uh, Surabaya, they belong to Jama Anju Daula JAD, which is a very pro-ISIS, very Salafabis extremist. So that is something which uh, has been to me, a positive development in uh, Indonesia since then. Um, okay, Professor, the last question, um, and then we'll let you go to your other activities. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I liked your three Ps and the four Ms as a way of kind of framing the discussion. And, uh, you know, there's we've spoken a lot about um, uh, counter narratives and countering radicalization. Um, what, what, in your view, what kinds of interventions are the most effective? Uh, and I realize we're talking about different contexts and different areas, but what kinds of interventions have you seen uh, be the most successful? Yeah, that's a good uh, practical question. <clears throat> uh, a few years ago, RSIS uh, co-organized a major conference in uh, Manila with uh, the Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy, PCID, and we were we were the, the two main organizations. We had a lot of support from other, other agencies as well, uh, international agencies as well. Uh, but this conference was very useful. We had about 400 people and we got a, a bunch of uh, participants from across uh, government, uh, from social media companies, uh, civil society, religious leaders from uh, the, not just Philippines, but the Southeast Asian region. Uh, and in terms of the the countering the extremist narrative, right? I think there are a couple of things which which uh, I recall, which I think are still relevant today. Number one, at some point, you you really do need to engage the religious leaders, the Muslim uh, Islamic scholars, if you like. How you engage them? Well, that really depends on your national context. Uh, you need to engage the, the religious leaders. Why? Because they are the ones, not the government, uh, the religious scholars, the independent religious scholars, the independent moderate religious scholars. They are the ones who know the uh, the hadiths and the, the Quran uh, the best, right? And they have the local standi and the credibility to sort of tell the, the audience, right? Uh, Look, this is uh, what these guys say about jihad. Oh, that's that's wrong, right? I mean, they can say it. So you need to have the religious leaders to establish the theological baseline uh, as to where uh, a, a religious thought becomes extreme. They can do it. So you have to have religious leaders. Number two, uh, you also need to expand the, the, the number of, I mean, the, the kinds of people involved to include women and youth, right? The role of women, and I think it's not just applies just to Southeast Asia. I mean, the role of women, you can see it's very important uh, across the world. Like, well, certainly in Southeast Asia, we have found that, you know, if the the, the woman, say the mom, 
or the spouse, right? If if the the mother or the the wife, right, is uh not radicalized, that is a powerful protective factor against radicalization within the family unit, right? But if the if, if it's the other way around, the mom or the spouse is also radicalized, uh, well, that's a that's a risk factor, and we saw that in the case of the Surabaya bombings. Well, not just the Surabaya bombings, which were linked to the Jamaat Shudawla, but also uh, even in southern Philippines, where uh, you know we've seen uh, families uh, implicated in terrorist uh, incidents as well. So, uh, uh, and young people, right? Uh, young people understand other young people. So, in terms of the four M's, right? Uh, in terms of uh, message uh, content dissemination, right? Young people have good ideas which can be uh, harnessed in designing alternative narratives uh, which could be targeted at other young people. So you have uh, religious scholars, you need women, you need young people. Yep. And final, the, the final thing which came out from that particular conference, which I think is still relevant, is uh, you need to have, well, it sounds like a cliche, but well, it's got to be a whole society approach. You need social media companies involved. You need social. You need the civil society people involved. You need the community leaders, the grassroots leaders involved. Uh, so and it's got to be orchestrated. It's got to be coordinated. So the role of the uh, government, a relevant, a relevant agency, would be to play that coordinating role, in order to devise effective. Uh, you need a coordinating role, and you need to be inclusive, right? And uh. You need the coordination to ensure that your alternative narratives actually have impact, right? And you got to design the composition of the stakeholders to who are going to be involved in line with that particular national context. That's and I think context matters as well. I think that's very important. Yeah, Professor, if you will, and you can answer very briefly. I've got a one final question, which I think is a really good one um, and worth. Um, worth uh, discussing. A number of foreign fighters from South Asia joined ISIS and Al-Qaeda in, in conflict zones. A number have now been repatriated. Um, how? Do, what's the impact um, uh, of those that have been repatriated in terms of radicalization and Salafism? In Southeast Asia, we had about uh, by some estimates, almost a thousand uh, individuals that went to uh, the Middle East at the height of the so-called ISIS Caliphate. Uh, mainly Indonesians, a number of Malaysians, very small number of uh, 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 Singaporeans. Uh, a number of them were repatriated. Uh, the the biggest challenge has been. Uh, because uh, it's not just fighters that came back. They came back with their families, right? So uh, a big challenge is now uh, reintegration, rehabilitation and reintegration. And this is why, uh, well, certainly Indonesia and Malaysia, they are paying a lot of attention to this. You don't see this that much in Singapore because Singapore is small and we didn't have that many people going there anyway. Uh, but in Indonesia, uh, particularly Indonesia, you, uh, the big challenge now is reintegration, rehabilitation. Uh, families, it's not just fighters, it's families. So, and uh, this is still ongoing and this has been the biggest challenge. Uh, but a uh, positive thing I can say is uh, I think the Indonesians understand this and uh, they are, uh, it's that really, that is an, a, a national effort which uh, involves not just uh, government agencies, but also uh, civil society has stepped up. So that's a very useful space to watch. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor, we're most grateful for your your time, especially given the uh, the time zone challenges. So I would like to thank you on behalf of all of us here um, in GTAC. Um, look forward to maintaining the contact and discussions. I'd like to thank everybody for listening in and stay tuned for our uh, next event. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and uh, see all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day.